everyone. So today we're going to go over Uplevel's Quick Start Training. This is going to be everything that you need to know in order to be successful with the Uplevel Unbox. We'll go over everything that you need just right out of the box to get you going. Make sure that you know exactly what to do when you get the system, where it applies, and where it does not. So first and foremost, just in case anyone's not aware, an overview of the system the gateway comes with a lot of different things built into it. They're all around that circle there. First of all, there is a one Terra NAS built into the gateway. There is also a five Terra option as well. Those NASs can be used as a file server to completely eliminate the need for an external file server on site. It'll completely replace it with that one or five Terra NAS. With that comes local as well as cloud backups. You can back up that data. Obviously, that's kind of your insurance policy to make sure that all of your critical data is replicated either locally and or in the cloud if ever there is a disaster that occurs. Next, you'll have site to site as well as client VPN. The difference between the two is you can either site to site two up level gateways together, or you can remote access VPN or client VPN back into the gateway. Say if a client is working from home or from a coffee shop where they need to get back into the office, get all of those mission critical files to keep working from home. You'll also notice that there are access points for that Wi-Fi enablement. Those access points are broken out as separate hardware, so just keep an eye out. But that actually allows for you to plug in as many access points as you need. So if they need multiple access points, you can plug them in as many as you need. Um, they'll all just plug directly into the gateway. It also means that you can put them in the spot where they best broadcast those RF signals, as opposed to the closet where the gateway is probably living, to make sure that that signal that all of those users are able to connect to easily. Also, there's routing and switching with the gateway. Obviously, it is a router itself. That is all built into the gateway. Obviously, additional PoE switches can be found as well. Again, additional hardware for those switches. But you will notice there are seven ports on the gateway after that internet uplink port that can be used on the LAN side as well. There's also three different kinds of security mechanisms built into the gateway. First is going to be the stateful port blocking firewall. That's going to be your initial line of defense for the system to prevent any unsolicited traffic from getting in to um, the local area network, the LAN on that side, any unsolicited where creepy crawlers are probing to get into the network that have not been requested from someone within the LAN. The other is going to be the IPS IDS or deep packet inspection firewall. That's going to inspect both inbound and outbound traffic for malicious content. So that's going to actually be your legitimate request, um, where a legitimate request has actually come out from the LAN. So someone from inside of the network has actually asked to either visit a website or requested that specific information, and there's malicious content flowing in either direction. So either a malicious attack going out or a malicious attack coming in um, that will prevent you or allow you to either block it or be alerted on it if there is any sort of malicious content going back and forth. And then thirdly, there's domain filtering. That's going to be your DNS filtering. That'll prevent users from getting to known bad websites in the first place. So that'll prevent them from accessing those malicious videos or clicking on any of those kind of known bad places to begin with to prevent that flow from ever occurring. So that's kind of your to make sure that users inside aren't actually accessing bad stuff to begin with. All of those are built in and it is all cloud monitored and managed. So it's all managed out of the cloud. It's all configured out of the cloud. Meaning if you have the system sitting right in front of you or if it's halfway around the world, you'll configure it the exact same way. Means really, really easy management as far as your customers go. You'll see all of your customers and be able to manage them from the cloud if you're ever moving around. Um, it also means that since all of those uh, different services always come enabled on the gateway, that it's a standard hardware deployment. So it means you always deploy the exact same gateway, the only difference being the one Terra versus the five Terra, and then you're off and running. And from there, you can go in and customize it with those different subscription levels to allow for that customization. It also means that as a customer grows, you can go in and change those uh, subscriptions as needed. So if ever anything changes, if they need to up security, if they need to go ahead and add additional access points, whatever it may be, it allows for you to actually grow with them as a managed service provider um, as, they, as things evolve over time. Whenever you receive the system, first and foremost, it'll come with some accessories. 
With all of our partners, we'll always offer a demo system. So if you ever want to test out our system, that's not a problem. We'll always offer a demo system. With that demo system will come, obviously, some Ethernet cables and power cables, both for the gateway as well as the access point. So keep those. They are needed. With the very first system, we'll also ship a surge protector. We don't ship it with any additional systems just because we assume that you have surge protectors. However, if you need them, just let us know. We'll ship them. It's just not in our standard deployment gear. And then the second is going to be a Cisco style serial cable. That serial cable is used for setting static IPs as well as troubleshooting any connectivity issues. Obviously, once that static IP is set, the cable is not needed anymore, but we highly recommend keeping those in a safe spot um, in case there is ever any issue with getting a gateway online or if you do have additional gateways that need a static IP set, we just ship that cable with the very first system. So keep that in mind. As soon as you receive the gateway, you'll want to plug it in, obviously, plug it into the internet as well as power it on. You'll just plug one of the LAN ports of the ISP modem directly into the internet uplink port one of the gateway. That way, it'll give us a couple of minutes to boot up. During that time, we'll actually reach out to Amazon Web and pull down any configuration changes that have been made. So one implication that that actually means is that you can go in and configure the gateway while it's offline. Every time it boots up, it'll automatically pull those new configuration changes from Amazon Web um, where we're hosting that server. But don't worry, you're not required to have an AWS account at all. We'll manage all of that. That's just where it's hosted for your visibility. And then once it's booted up and powered on, you can go ahead and plug in an access point. Um, those access points, as you'll see, the seven remaining ports on the gateway are not PoE, so you will need a PoE injector. However, we'll always ship one with each additional access point. And like I said, you can plug in as many access points as you need. Obviously, if you're using a PoE switch, that's totally fine. You won't need that injector, obviously, so just plug it directly into the PoE switch. However, one recommendation I highly, highly, highly make is going to be to plug an up-level access point directly into an up-level switch or gateway. So plug it into an up-level logo, either the switch or the gateway, directly for a couple of reasons. First of all, the Wi-Fi controller is built into the gateway itself. So there is a layer three management protocol between the gateway where the Wi-Fi controller is and the access point itself. Third party managed switches could and do tend to block these layer three management protocols between the two. So you'll want to make sure that those are there is a clear connection between the gateway and the access point. And then second of all, those access points are actually broadcasting over multiple VLANs and subnets. Those trunks have to be configured properly. So keep that in mind. We always, always, always recommend just plugging it directly into an up-level logo. If you're using third-party switches, that's totally fine. Just plug the access point directly into the up-level gateway. So for all of the services online, we will never, ever, ever require a static IP. That includes site-to-site -site VPN as well as remote access VPN. Um, we don't require it at all, but obviously there are customers and or other services on site that may require a static IP. That's totally fine, in which case it is the one and only thing that cannot be done from the dashboard. It must be done with the gateway in hand and a Cisco style serial cable, and then you'll use a terminal program like Hyper Terminal or Putty to get into the command line to set that static IP. It's about seven command lines in total to get to the interface, set the IPs, and then back back out of it. Um, but keep in mind, it is the one and only thing that cannot be done from the dashboard. You do need to have that, that Cisco style serial cable and the gateway in hand. Very easy, just requires being on site. Those Cisco style serial cables are also great for troubleshooting if you ever can't get the gateway online. Another great troubleshooting tip or trick is going to be the LED lights located on the back of the gateway. So that's gonna be opposite those eight ports on the back. You'll see a long string of LED lights. This is going to give you a great indication of where it is during its boot up phase and what's going on if there are any issues. So it'll take about five minutes for the gateway to boot up once it's powered on. And during that time, it will appear as offline on the dashboard. However, if you want to know where it is in that boot up phase, you can always look at those LEDs located on the back to see what's going on. Obviously, power, you want that light to be on. But second of all, this status light is going to give you a ton of information. So it'll take about a minute for the status light to present a color. Uh, from there, you'll have four different color options. 
to choose from. Green is going to indicate a normal operation on the land side. Everything is working well. It does have internet access, which is the important part. Um, we're also handing out IP addresses, so on and so forth. So it means normal operation on the land side as well as the WAN. The next option is going to be a blue status light. Blue indicates that there's uh, a, an active data push or pull between the gateway itself and the cloud. So during the boot up phase, it means it's actually going up and pulling down those configurations from AWS uh, for that boot up process to pull down any configuration changes that have been made and realigning those things accordingly. Bear with it, the important part is that it does have internet access, however, it will take another minute or so for those configuration changes to get pulled down and for it to get up and running. The next status color is going to be purple. Purple indicates the gateway is actually doing a firmware upgrade. So anytime we do firmware upgrades, we'll obviously always notify you that there is an upgrade happening as well as what that upgrading window is. You'll always be fully notified However, if the gateway is ever offline during those upgrading windows, the next time it is powered on and connected up to the internet, it will automatically begin to download that new firmware image. Um, depending on the specific firmware package, that can take up to 30 minutes, as well as the internet downlink of the gateway itself. Um, obviously, if it's doing a firmware pull from the cloud, you do not want to interrupt that process at all. Depending on that specific firmware image, it may be doing a flash rewrite. You absolutely do not want to interrupt that process. So just leave the gateway alone. 30 minutes can obviously feel like an eternity if you're on a site at a customer's location. So we always, always, always recommend plugging in an offline gateway before going on site, just in case there are any pending firmware upgrades going on, as well as um, just after shipment, kind of the best practice to plug it in just to make sure nothing happened during shipment. And your last status color is going to be red. Red indicates that the gateway does not have internet access. So it means that somewhere along the line there is a misconfiguration between the gateway and it cannot get out to the internet. The next light that you're going to want to look at, if that is the case, is going to be the A light. The A light is going to indicate whether or not the gateway has a DHCP IP address or not. If you're setting a static IP, this A light will obviously remain off. However, the A light only has two color options, either green or off. Um, so if it does appear red, it means the A light is in fact off and it's just a bleed over from the status light. But if you're expecting the gateway to get a DHCP IP address, then you'll want to ensure that that A light is in fact on. Keep in mind that will be a DHCP either from the ISP modem as a whole or the ISP as a whole. So either directly from the land side of the ISP modem or from the ISP as a whole. You'll wanna make sure that that does in fact line up with your expectations of what's going on or what should be happening. The last status color is going to be the C light located on the far right of the gateway. The C light is going to indicate whether or not the gateway is in recovery mode. Recovery mode occurs whenever the gateway's boot up cycle prematurely fails. So, so if for instance, the gateway is powered on and then immediately the power is pulled five to 10 seconds later, where that first initial boot up phase that takes about 60 seconds is interrupted. The next time it's powered on, it will immediately go into recovery mode. It'll pull itself out of recovery mode, so you don't need to worry about that. However, it does need internet access. This can take about 10 to 15 minutes, depending on the downlink of the gateway itself. Um, however, it will pull itself out so long as it has internet access, um, but nothing will be operating on the land side. It'll go up and ensure that no Firmware um, was corrupt, that, that flash boot up phase is not corrupt in any way, and then we'll begin as soon as that download is complete. So make sure if you're moving things around, unplugging and plugging things in quite quickly, that you ensure that the gateway did fully boot up before pulling the power on it to ensure it doesn't go into recovery mode. So now hopping over to the dashboard, as soon as you're logged in, you'll see this single pane of glass where all of your customers will appear. What that means is that as you deploy gateways, each customer will have their own bar or tab, and those will stack down the page as needed. So for instance, this cost crusher CPA um, is one particular customer. However, additional customers would get their own tab and they would just line down the page here. You'll obviously notice their status of those customers indicated by this light. So for instance, this 
particular customer, everything is operating normal, everything looks good. But if there were a failure, that would appear as red. With a slight description on the right, a warning would appear as yellow. You can then click on that customer to get more information about what's going on at each of those different office locations. So for instance, if a customer has more than one office location, you'll see all of those office locations broken out separately so that you can configure them and monitor them separately as you would, but then they'll collapse under a single customer. From there, you can view all of the different services and the statuses of those services operating at each office location. So for instance, this Plano location, you can see that there was a new event reported on the internet connection. I can click on that to get more information about what exactly was going on. Three hours ago, it looks like we had a reestablished ISP link. The other options are going to be any other services that are currently enabled on the site. And again, you can just click on those to get more information about past issues or current issues that are going on to see what exactly is happening. Up in the top right hand corner, you'll see a little man. From here, you can go to settings. This will bring you to the settings of the network as a whole or your account as a whole. So for instance, um, this is where you can come in and change the password of your specific dashboard if you would like. You can also come in and add other accounts by clicking this other accounts option. These other accounts are going to be given access to the entire dashboard. So that's going to be everyone in the dashboard itself um, that user will have access to. So it's really intended for other techs on site as opposed to in customers wanting to get in to view their system. So keep that in mind. The other options up here are going to be the notifications tab. The notifications tab allows for you to come in and configure email notifications for a particular system. So for instance, if there's ever a failure or a warning that occurs, you can come in, specify those email addresses here, just separated by commas, to who will get the email if there is a failure or warning. And then down at the bottom, you can specify what the subject line and email body of each of those look like. So for instance, you'll see here, down at the very, very bottom, there are a list of uh, variables that you can come in and use in those email subject lines and bodies, just uh, indicated by curly brackets. So you can come in and specify those here in combination with clear text to fit with any parsing rules that you may have on the network or in your email so that you best manage all of those customers. The next option is going to be the reports option. Reports allows for you to generate email reports of all of your customers, either on a monthly basis or immediately. You can come in and specify your company name so that those reports have your company name, as well as upload a file um, of your logo so that those are uh, generated with your company logo on them as well. And then who to send the reports to. Like I said, we'll send them out either the first of each month or you can send them out immediately once those um, report settings are, are set. From there, to get back to the dashboard, you'll just click on the up-level logo in the top left-hand corner. That'll bring you back to that first initial page where you can view all of your customers. From there, if you want to configure a specific customer, you'll just go in, click on that specific customer, and then you'll see that configure option for the site that you are wanting to configure. This will bring you to the overview page of the network. So this will be the overview as a whole of the network where you can get a lot of great information about what's currently operating everywhere on the network as a whole. So for instance, up at the top, you'll see a lot of great information. First of all, the internet port one uplink, that's going to be, um, the IP information of that port one on the gateway. You can obviously see that here it's under a double NAT scenario. So there is um, another NATed modem sitting in front of it that's handing out a private IP address. We'll absolutely work in a double NAT scenario just the same. So if you need to put it in a double NAT scenario for testing purposes, you're more than welcome to. It will operate the exact same. However, we obviously don't recommend it for deployment scenarios. To the right, you'll see the public IP address uh, of the network as needed as well. And then in the middle, you'll see the internet port auxiliary link IP address. That's going to be your dual WAN failover. So there is dual WAN failover built into the gateway itself with that auxiliary port being your secondary ISP link. Anytime the internet port uplink one goes down, we'll automatically fail over to that auxiliary port and then revert back once port one is reestablished. 
You'll also get, as you kind of look down the page, great information about the ports on the gateway itself and their current statuses. So obviously here up at the top, you'll see all of those link ports that are uh, holding the internet link as well as the Wi-Fi access point, all those uplinks here. As you scroll down, you'll also get a great view of the network as a whole. So you'll view all VLANs and subnets that are created on the network, as well as any resources that are located within them. All of those different resources are segregated together. So for instance, any ports that are allocated to the same group or VLAN and subnet combination will have access to one another. Those are actually a combination of VLAN subnets and firewall rules. So the three together allow us to go in and group resources together. So what I mean by resources are SSIDs, storage drives, and Ethernet ports. You can come in and group those together to prevent employees from getting access to them when they shouldn't and vice versa, giving access to those employees that only need them. For instance, anyone connected to this employee's Wi-Fi would have access to this drive 401, as well as any resource that's located on these four ports here. All of those resources are then grouped together to prevent access from the outside, but also grant those within access to those. Kind of our answer to any company that needs to segregate out resources, but doesn't necessarily want to implement a full AD implementation. Again, as you scroll down, you'll see all of those different groups here with all of the different resources located within them. There are three exceptions to the rule. There are three predefined groups. Those predefined groups are going to be the guest, the employees, and the boss groups. The guest group is a Wi-Fi only group that's located outside of the firewall, meant for internet access only via Wi-Fi. The second is going to be the boss group. The boss group is really meant to be an administrative or an admin group with admin privileges into any and all groups that are created on the network, as well as any resources within them. So any resource located on the network, the boss has a one-way access via those firewall rules into that specific group and resource. The green groups in the middle are going to be the functional groups. Those functional groups are any group that you create on the network after the fact for functional purposes. There are firewall rules between all of those green groups preventing the accounting group and the sales group from viewing each other's resources. So it segregates all of those resources out. However, again, one-way firewall rules allow for those boss groups to have access to those uh, two groups respectively. Down at the bottom, you'll see the employees group. The employees group is really meant to be a general company pool of documents or resources. Again, this is done via one-way firewall rules that allow any employee on the network to have access to the employees group. Really meant for printers that are located in the lobby or general documents that everyone needs to access on the network with those one-way firewall rules into the employees group. Down at the bottom of the configure page, you'll see an add group option. This is where you can come in and create one of those new groups. Those will be one of the green groups in the middle that'll give you access to, um, or allow you to go in and allocate resources to that group. You'll just specify the name as well as the subnet if you'd like to specify that, and then hit create, and that'll create one of these dashed out boxes here. As you can see, I'll go ahead and create one now. So that'll create one of those dashed out boxes down at the bottom to allow for resources to be allocated to it via this left hand pane. Now before I get into resource allocation, let's go ahead and hop over to site settings. Site settings is where you can come in and change the name of the customer as a whole. So this is going to be up at the top. You'll see the customer name here. This is where you can change that guy. You'll also notice the site name as well. So for instance, if they had multiple office locations, you could change that site name here as well. Down at the bottom, you'll also see a spare device checkbox. This will allow you to mark it as spare. So if you want to go ahead and leave it out of the view of, um, of the whole dashboard, you can do so. And then you'll have the option on the main dashboard to un unhide those spare devices as needed, but that way you can kind of unclutter if you have inventory um, all of your devices. The second option here is going to be the IDNS option. The IP and DNS option allows for you to go in and specify the IP address of the network as a whole. So all of those groups that I have created, I can come in and change the network IP addressing as a whole on the LAN scheme. You'll see the site network for the customer up at the top. This will determine what subnets can be created on the network 
or all of the different subnets within. Those That dash 20 indicates that the first 20 bits are being used for the customer network as a whole. This group prefix length will determine what the specific uh, length of each of those subnets indicates. So starting at the 24th bit, anything after that will be a part of those subnets for individual IP addresses, meaning the subnets have four bits to mess with. You have four bit options in the middle between that 20th bit and the 24th bit to segregate those different subnets out. As you scroll down, you'll see all of those different subnets located here, and you can go in and specify which group is located on which subnet just by typing it in there um, into their respective fields. You'll see to the right also a details option. That details is going to let you come in and either enable or disable that DHCP server as a whole for that subnet or to specify the DHCP range of that server so that they don't collide with any static IPs on the network. You'll also see all of the static IP ranges here and how many devices is left for the DHCP pool for each of those different subnets. Up at the top, you'll see a DNS option. The DNS option is going to do a handful of things. First of all, you can come in and set the dynamic DNS of the gateway. So if you're using a dynamic DNS server, service, that's totally fine. Um, you can come in and specify that dynamic DNS service here. Um, obviously, you have a couple of options as far as DIN DNS, no IP, or us, um, where we'll go ahead and just specify a dynamic DNS server for you. Um, that is intended for if you have any sort of services on site that need to have a static IP that'll allow you to actually point to those specific IP addresses via dynamic DNS on the public WAN side um, to prevent you from having to pay for a static IP. The next option is going to be the local network DNS settings. These local network DNS settings are going to be the internal DNS of the gateway itself. So the internal DNS of the gateway itself is used for if there are any devices that you want to um, connect to rather than searching for them via IP address, you can search for them via DNS. We'll resolve them based on the customer DNS suffix and site prefix here. You'll get an example of what this will look like as a whole, the fully qualified DNS name there um, as needed, right? So that's for internal DNS purposes if you're trying to ping specific DNSs as opposed to IP addresses on the local side. And then down at the very bottom, you'll see the DNS servers. This is going to be the server that the gateway points to whenever there is a public resolution question. So whenever anyone's doing a DNS query or trying to get to a specific website, this will let you point all of those different groups to specific DNS servers as needed. You can come in and specify which DNS service or server you would like to point it to to resolve that DNS request. Those are the three kinds of DNSs there. If you head back over to the overview page, like I said, this is an overview of the entire network. And then from there, you can go in and allocate specific resources on the network to allow uh, for those different employees to access it based on that resource allocation. So for instance, you can come into the Wi-Fi tab here to create new SSIDs for those different groups. Just come in, specify a new name and a password for that Wi-Fi connection. And then you can come in and specify which group you'd like it to allocate to. So you can come choose from that drop down menu as to who should be accessing that specific SSID. And that'll, down at the bottom, you'll see a guest Wi-Fi option. The guest Wi-Fi is really meant, like I said, to be an internet access only, meant for guest users, and it's located outside of the firewall. This is created under that Wi-Fi tab because it is a Wi-Fi only group. Again, same thing, you'll just specify the SSID and password, but you can also come in and limit the bandwidth both up and down for that guest network as a whole to prevent users from overloading the network, maybe that are sitting in the lobby or something along those lines. And then down at the bottom, you'll see configure access points option. This is going to allow you to come in and configure those access points independently if you would like or together um, by specifying which channel both the 2.4 and the 5 gig ranges are operating on, as well as the transmitting power for both of those. You can come in um, and notice that all the access points that are plugged in 
will automatically register up. So you can plug those access points into any port that you would like on the up-level gateway itself, will automatically register them up. And then from there, they'll broadcast both the 2.4 and the 5 gig ranges. All of those access points will also broadcast all of the SSIDs that are configured. And all of those access points will hand off to one another as they walk throughout the office. You can come in and hit this advanced option, which will give you more options as far as um, the channel width of the 5 gig range, as well as the optimization levels of the access points there. And then you can also come in and reboot access points if there's ever an issue or if you'd like to kick off lingering clients. The next resource is going to be the storage option. Storage is going to be partitioning off part of that one tera or five tera NAS. So that's going to be managing that uh, NAS and file server built into the gateway. You can come in and create new drive names as needed, also specifying a size and determining who can access those files by specifying that group there. That'll automatically partition off part of that drive and allow you to go in and allocate resources to it. You'll notice the file share path here for that file server. You will need to map that drive. And then the other option is to come in and configure backups, either local or cloud backups as needed. You can specify the frequency and starting time and how many snapshots are being kept. Those snapshots are actually going to be the deltas or the difference between the last backup and the current drive. That's going to allow for incredible storage efficiency, meaning you don't actually have to have um, 500 gigs worth of space to back up a 500 gig drive. It'll just take the deltas each time to keep that storage efficiency there and allow for um, those local backups to not consume as much space. Same goes for those cloud backups. We're still only pushing up the deltas. However, for the cloud backups, keep in mind the delta is everything. So for the first, the very first seed backup, that first delta is everything. Um, so you'll want to be really, really mindful of the internet uplink on the customer site as well as how much active data they have on their network as a whole. That will be really telling as to how long the backup will take for that first initial seed backup as well as if it'll clog the network as a whole during business hours. Down at the bottom, you'll see an option to come in and limit the bandwidth of those backups in case it does get to the point where um, it's going and consuming a large chunk of that internet up on the network and preventing them from actually getting out and doing useful work, right? So you can come and limit that down. Once you have those storage drives enabled, you can go into the restore files option. This will allow you to come in and specify the drive that you'd like to restore and then come in and view any files or folders that are located on that drive to restore them directly to the gateway. You'll be presented with an option to go in and specify which drive you'd like to restore from, um, as well as which snapshot. And then from there, you'll see a list of all of those files and folders that are located on that specific drive at that time and can restore from them there. Obviously, there aren't any snapshots here right now, but if there were, you would see all of those appear here. The next resource is going to be the Ethernet ports. Ethernet ports allow for you to come in and uh, configure those ports that are located on the gateway itself. So the seven remaining ports after that internet uplink, you'll see all of those appear here. You'll also notice that any switch ports that are connected, so any up-level switch that's connected, you'll see all of those ports appear here as well. So for instance, if you had a 22 port switch, you would see all 30 ports in total that you can go in and configure the exact same way. To the left, you'll see a checkbox that allows for you to come in and enable or disable those specific ports. And then to the right, you'll have the option to move those ports around into those different VLANs and subnets just using that drop down menu to the right of each port. Once all of those resources are partitioned out, you can go into the overview page and view all of those there. From there, you can come in and view the devices. Devices allows for you to view any connected devices to the network itself. So any device that's probed the gateway for information that's connected on the LAN side will appear here. It's actually going to be a passive view. So what I mean by that is anytime a device actively contacts the gateway for information, we're logging here. I say that to mean don't be alarmed if you ever see a device that's connected to the gateway itself, but for some reason is showing as offline. It just means that there's no active data transfer between the gateway and the device um, itself. 
nothing to be alarmed of. You'll also get all of the other information about that device just going across the screen as far as what group it's connected to, the MAC address of the device, the IP address, how it's connected in. So you will see both physical as well as wireless connections appear here, what time, and you have the option to reserve the specific IP address of that device. That's going to be a DHCP pool reservation. Up at the top, you'll see a ping, et cetera, button where you can come in and either ping specific IP addresses or scan the entire network. These are obviously very active probings for a response on the network. Those probings actually do work as well on the WAN sites. You can ping public IP addresses as needed as well. If there are any connectivity issues, maybe with a VoIP server or any other sort of outside server, uh, you can go in and ping those specific IP addresses as needed um, to, to resolve any of those issues, make sure that the gateway doesn't have, in fact, have connectivity to that specific IP address. The next service is going to be Remote Access VPN. That's going to be this VPN tab here. This will allow you to come in and establish new connections for users that are wanting to work from home or from a coffee shop or anywhere outside of the office that are needing to get back in. This is actually going to be an L2TP or an SSTP connection with all of the configuration done from the native client. That's going to be the built-in Windows or Mac client that's built into the computer itself. You'll type in all of the information you see here into that native client. And then from there, you'll have the ability to come in and specify a new username and password for that connection, as well as specify which group it is going to have access to. That means that all of those group permissions are still intact, even over that VPN connection. And then from there, the user will then be able to log in easily, get back into the network as a whole. The next service option is going to be the VoIP option. This is going to allow you to set QoS parameters for any VoIP system that's located on the network. So you can go ahead and enable that VoIP group there. We'll do a handful of things. First of all, we'll ask you what the specific, what kind of phone system that you're using, either an on-prem or an off-prem server. If it is an on-prem server, then we'll go ahead and ask who the service provider or who uh, the manufacturer is of that on-prem server. And you can specify that there. As soon as that's done, we'll do a couple of things. First of all, we'll create a VoIP group in VLAN. So we'll automatically segregate all of that VoIP traffic off, create that specific group for it. We'll also punch any firewall rules through that need punching. So for any on-prem server that have port forwarding rules, we'll automatically go ahead and punch those through. And then third of all, we'll QoS based on these upload and download links of the network itself. So you can come in and specify the upload and download links of the network and we'll QoS based on those parameters. That up and down link is going to be the network as a whole, whatever is reliably delivered to the entire network, as opposed to what you want the VoIP, um, the VoIP calls to be using. It is the, the network as a whole, and that way we'll know what our ceiling is to make sure that the VoIP always gets first priority and that data gets anything left over. You can also come in and support daisy chaining of phones and PCs. That's going to be when a phone and PC is hooked onto the same Ethernet line through those daisy chained phones. Um, that's totally fine. You'll just make sure to go ahead and check that option. And then from there, if you do have daisy chain phones, you'll want to come in and configure those phones to the VLAN of the VoIP group. You can see the VLAN tag of that VoIP group specified here back in the overview page and then using the ethernet tab you can come in and directly connected phones you'll move those ports into that VoIP group on the right so the firewall allows for you to come in and view any statistics first of all of any packets that have been received analyzed and alerted on as well as port attacks that are prevented by country and protocol so we'll let you know the port count on each of those ports on the inbound stateful firewall and then as well as domain filtering you can view all of this domain filtering statistics at the bottom up at the top you have three other options these are going to be the three different kinds of securities that you can implement on the gateway the first is going to be the stateful port blocking firewall that's going to be that port blocking tab up at the top this is going to be where the initial posture is that any unsolicited traffic is automatically blocked so that'll allow you to go ahead and block any creepy crawlers probing to get into the network that were not solicited from inside. 
Obviously, you can come in and punch holes through that firewall as needed. So for instance, if there is a specific server or service on site that needs to have a two-way connection between the internet at all times, you can go ahead and specify what port that specific traffic is coming in over, where to forward it to on the local side as far as IP addresses go, and then you also have more options down at the bottom to map it to a different drive or accept it only from specific source IPs. You'll also see this library option up at the top. This is going to allow you to come in and specify library rules. So if you want to um, go ahead and pre-configure rules that maybe you use a lot, you'll have this library option here. To get to the overall library, you'll click on the little man in the top right hand corner and then go to that library option. This will allow you to come in and specify those rules that you'd like to have automatically available. And then from there, you can click on this library option here to specify that there. The other firewall option is going to be the threat analysis tab. This is going to be your IPS, IDS, or deep packet inspection firewall. This will inspect both inbound and outbound traffic for malicious content to prevent any uh, malicious content either from getting in or out by automatically dropping it or forum alerting on it. You can turn on and off that threat analysis here by clicking this little checkbox in the top left hand corner. And then you'll also notice that you have the ability to come in and set your initial alerting postures and dropping postures. So you can specify how much traffic to automatically drop versus alert on as time goes on. You can also come in and determine whether or not you want to protect the guest network. So whether or not you'd like to inspect traffic for the guest network as well, and then specify an email address if you'd like to receive alerts, either daily, weekly, or immediately, if there are any alerts or drops that are occurring. Once you go ahead and specify all of those postures, you'll see all alerts appear here. This will tell you um, a lot of great information. First of all, what the specific attack profile is that we're queuing off of. And then if you click up three dots to the right of each of those attacks, you'll see more information about what the IP address was that it went to internally as well as where it came from externally, and then what to do with it moving forward. You have a lot of options as far as dropping and alerting kind of specifications on a per IP level. Up at the top, you'll also see an exceptions option. This will allow you to come in and view any exceptions that have been made. So any additional rules on top of the alerting and dropping postures that you specified. You can always come in and delete those rules as needed though, if anything ever occurs um, and you need to delete unnecessary rules. You can also view statistics on that statistics page of anything that's going on. The last option under the firewall tab is going to be domain filtering. The domain filtering option allows for you to come in and block any DNS request from the LAN. So anyone on the LAN side that's probably trying to look at um, specific known bad websites, you can come in and block those requests from getting out so that they can never actually access the internet in the first place. You obviously have a long laundry list of categories to choose from if you want to select specific categories, or you can always come in and block specific domains as well. You can separate them out by commas if there are a lot. Just specify all of those here. That'll prevent employees from getting to those websites. You also have the allow domains option, which will allow you to whitelist um, specific domain names if there are specific ones that employees do need to get to that may be classified on the other uh, block categories list. Let's say, for instance, you want to block social media, but for, uh, for some reason you need the employees to be able to get to Facebook, you can block the entire social media category, but then go ahead and whitelist Facebook and they will still be able to whitelist and get to Facebook. Down at the bottom, you'll see a filter groups option. The filter groups allows for you to specify which group gets these rules and which do not. It is a yes or no question, so the groups either get the rules or they do not. Um, but this will allow you to specify which groups this uh, DNS server is pointed to. And then in the middle, you'll see these access keys. These access keys allow for employees to overwrite a denial that they've received. So for instance, if they try to get to a blocked website, they'll get a denial screen. And then from there, if they do in fact need access to that website, they can input either this temporary access key or a main access key that you specify here. That'll allow them to override that denial and still get to the website 
as needed. Once you turn on domain filtering, if you head back to the IP and DNS option, down at the bottom under DNS servers, you will notice that the DNS servers are now being managed by domain filtering, so it'll prevent you from changing those DNS servers, but that's important, that's good, it means the DNS uh, the domain filtering is working. If there are ever any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to support. Support has a lot of great resources, so if there are ever any questions that we can answer, please feel free to reach out. We're more than happy to answer any questions that may come up or uh, get you more information about the specific topic that you're looking at. Thanks so much, guys.